Welcome to the Virginia Department of Transportation Flagger video. Your safety, the safety of your fellow workers, and the safety of the traveling public will depend on you performing your flagging duties properly. An effective flagging operation is not something that just happens. It's the result of planning, proper training, and the use of good flagging procedures. This program was developed to help you prepare to be a flagger. As a flagger, you're in contact with the public more than anyone else on the job. Your attitude and appearance directly affect the public's view of operations. A flagger's responsibilities are critical in keeping the work zone safe. Flaggers should have the following minimum qualifications, skills, and abilities. A sense of responsibility for the safety of the public and the workers. Adequate training in safe temporary traffic control practices. Be in good physical condition, including sight, mobility, and hearing. Be mentally alert and have the ability to react in an emergency. They should have a courteous but firm manner. Be able to communicate in English specific instructions clearly, firmly, and courteously. And be at least 18 years old. Your first responsibility as a flagger is to ensure you have the correct equipment to do your job. Improper equipment reduces the driver's ability to see you and react appropriately. Neat dress and appearance also helps you gain the driver's respect, making your job that much easier. The Virginia Work Area Protection Manual specifies that the flagger shall wear high visibility safety apparel that meets the Performance Class 3 requirements of the ANSI SEA 107-2010. The apparel's outer material shall be fluorescent orange-red, fluorescent yellow-green, or a combination of the two. Its retro-reflective material shall be visible at a minimum distance of 1,000 feet. The safety apparel shall be clean and fastened securely so it is visible 360 degrees around the flagger. High visibility Class E trousers should be considered during daylight hours to improve the visibility of the flagger. At a minimum, flaggers should wear long pants during daylight hours. The flagger shall also wear an approved hard hat and steel-toed safety shoes. It is also a good idea to carry an air horn or a whistle to alert your coworkers if a vehicle appears likely to run into the work area. The main traffic control device used by flaggers is the stop slow paddle. The sign is octagon shaped, at least 24 by 24 inches with eight inch high letters. The stop R1-1 face shall have white letters and a white border on a red background. The slow W20-8V face shall have black letters and a black border on an orange background. The sign is mounted on a rigid staff and is tall enough to be seen by approaching drivers when resting on the ground, ideally measuring at least five feet from the ground to the bottom of the sign. A seven foot paddle is even more visible. Before beginning any flagging operation, advance warning signs must be installed. For most flagging operations in Virginia, this will include a road work ahead sign, a one lane road ahead sign, a be prepared to stop sign, and a graphic flagger symbol sign. In some cases, other advance warning signs may be used, but in all cases, the flagger signs must be in place before the flagging operation begins. With advance warning signs in place, and with proper equipment, the flaggers may now begin controlling traffic. Because drivers are sometimes tired, preoccupied, or impaired, you must remain alert at all times and stay on your feet facing oncoming traffic. Always stand alone in a highly visible location away from other workers and work vehicles. However, never stand directly in the path of an approaching vehicle and never turn your back to approaching traffic. Generally, flagging operations require three basic skills, stopping, releasing, and slowing traffic. To stop traffic, stand on the shoulder of the roadway with the stop paddle away from your body 
on or near the edge of the pavement. Look directly at the approaching traffic. Raise your free hand with the palm exposed to the approaching driver. Make eye contact with the driver. After you have stopped the first vehicle, remain on the shoulder of the road. This is your normal flagging location. Do not enter the roadway to try to get a driver's attention or after traffic has stopped. Never stand in the path of oncoming traffic. On occasion, stopped motorists may ask you questions. If absolutely necessary, approach the passenger side of the stopped vehicle to assist the motorist. Never approach the vehicle from the driver's side. Your response should be brief but firm and courteous. Do not lean or touch the vehicle while doing this. There are two ways to release traffic. The first way is from the closed lane. To release traffic from the closed lane, while standing on the shoulder, turn the slow side of the paddle to face vehicles. With your free arm, signal the drivers to proceed into the open lane. Be direct and point in the direction you want the traffic to go. Never wave the paddle. After all the vehicles have passed, turn the paddle to stop and wait for the next vehicle. The second way to release traffic is from the open lane. After the road is clear ahead, while standing on the shoulder, display the slow paddle to the drivers. With your free arm, motion the drivers to proceed. Again, be direct and deliberate in your motions. In some cases, you may not need to stop traffic, but slow it down. In these cases, always stand on the shoulder of the road or in a closed off portion of roadway, displaying the slow paddle to oncoming traffic. With your free arm outstretched, motion in an up and down motion to slow traffic down. Remember, never stand in the path of oncoming traffic. If you'd learn the three basic skills of stopping, releasing, and slowing traffic, you'll be well prepared for any flagging operation. Situations will vary, and how you apply these skills will differ from project to project. Remember, never start any flagging operation until the advanced warning signs are in place. These signs tell the driver that you're controlling traffic. Without these advanced warning signs, the driver does not expect you to be in the roadway. Now, let's look at some typical situations a flagger may face. The first situation, probably the most common, is the one-way, two-lane flagger operation. Two flaggers are typically used. They must be able to communicate with one another. This can be done by keeping visual contact or using radios. In this case, a lead flagger is always in charge of the operation. If visual contact is possible in the work zone, then the operation normally works like this. One flagger displays the stop paddle and stops traffic. The second flagger displays the slow paddle and releases traffic. The first flagger continues to display the stop paddle and stops all traffic until the second flagger turns their paddle to stop and gives an all clear signal. This signal tells the first flagger they may release their traffic by displaying the slow paddle. The all clear message can be given visually by using a signal such as lifting one's hat. Be careful, however, not to use hand signals that may confuse the motorist, such as waving. When visual contact is not possible, such as over hills or around curves, then radios are the best way to maintain communication between flaggers. The second situation is the use of a pilot car for traffic control. This method works best where the route is particularly long or where traffic has shifted numerous times through multiple work areas. The pilot vehicle is used to guide a train of vehicles through or around the work area. This operation uses a flagger at each end of the one lane section and at all intersecting roadways. In this type of operation, the flaggers hold traffic at each end of the work zone until the pilot car arrives at their flagger station and leads the traffic through the work zone. Often, flaggers must speak to the first stopped motorist to advise them on what to do once the pilot vehicle arrives. A safe turnaround location should be provided for the pilot vehicle at each end of the work zone. Each flagger should also identify to the other flagger the identification of the last vehicle in the convoy. The vehicle selected for the pilot vehicle should be lightweight and easy to handle. 
It should have the name of the agency or contractor clearly displayed and be equipped with an amber high intensity warning light. The pilot car follow me sign shall also be mounted on the rear of the vehicle. Two or more pilot vehicles may be used to guide traffic through a particularly complex or challenging work area. The third situation is nighttime flagging operations. These procedures are generally the same as daytime operations except for clothing and equipment changes. High visibility class three ensemble shall be worn, which includes the outermost apparel as well as class E pants. Class E shorts shall not be worn at any time. A flashlight with red glow cone is recommended to enhance the flagger's movements along with the stop slow paddle. In addition, overhead auxiliary lighting shall be used. It should be placed perpendicular to traffic to illuminate the flagging station while minimizing glare to motorists. This is the safest way to flag at night. The more visible you are, the easier it is for the driver to see you and to follow your instructions. To stop an approaching vehicle, stand on the shoulder of the road holding the stop paddle in your hand closest to traffic. Hold the flashlight with red glow cone with the left arm extended and pointed down toward the ground and then slowly wave the flashlight in front of the body in a slow arc from left to right, such that the arc reaches no farther than 45 degrees from vertical. Do not stand in the travel lane. To release traffic, turn the paddle to slow and direct traffic to proceed. Point the flashlight toward the vehicle's bumper and aim the flashlight toward the open lane, then hold the flashlight in that position. Do not wave the flashlight while releasing traffic. This might confuse the drivers. To slow traffic, the flagger shall point the flashlight with red glow cone toward oncoming traffic and quickly wave the flashlight in a figure eight motion. The fourth situation is a single flagger operation. Sometimes only one flagger is needed to control traffic on a low volume two lane road. Where only one flagger is used, the work area must be short fairly straight with low traffic volumes and speeds. The flagger must be visible for a minimum of 500 feet to approaching traffic from both directions. In a single flagger operation, the flagger stands on the shoulder directly across from the work area so that he or she is visible to traffic approaching from either direction. Then the flagger can assign right of way with the paddle. Remember, a single flagger operation is only acceptable for low volume conditions, that is, roadways with less than 500 vehicles per day, or about 20 to 25 vehicles per hour, and where there is good sight distance from both approaches and the work area is short. The fifth situation involves only one flagger restricting only one direction of traffic. An example of this is an area where trucks are loading or unloading and are blocking a lane. The flagger stops traffic in the usual manner. Once the work has been completed and the way is clear, the flagger releases traffic. When releasing traffic on a two-lane highway where traffic is stopped temporarily in only one lane, turn the paddle a quarter turn so the word stop faces you. In this position, the sign is parallel to the shoulder of the road so that neither the stop nor slow message can be read by motorists approaching from either direction. The sixth situation is a non-stationary flagging operation. In this flagging operation, one or both flaggers move with the work operation. The operation normally works like this. One flagger displays the stop paddle and stops traffic while the other displays the slow paddle and releases traffic. Radios are typically used to communicate between flaggers. The flaggers take turns stopping and releasing traffic. Each flagger must identify the last vehicle in the convoy to the other flagger. The signs for this operation are road work next two miles, one lane road ahead, be prepared to stop, and the graphic flagger symbol sign. Additional graphic flagger symbol signs and their sign stands shall be placed every half mile after the initial graphic flagger symbol sign. These signs are laid on the ground so that they are not visible to traffic. The sign stand may be placed on top of the sign to keep it from blowing away. 
It is your job as a flagger to ensure that you are visible to motorists at all times as the work progresses. Do not put yourself in an unsafe location. You may need to notify your supervisor or the pilot vehicle driver to assist you by protecting you as you walk to a new location. If you ride in a vehicle to a new flagger station, you must be inside the vehicle with your seatbelt securely fastened. Flaggers, it is critical and your responsibility that you have an escape route at all times. When you arrive at a graphic flagger symbol sign, it may be your job to install it on the stand. The flagger must stop traffic first before installing the sign. If traffic is heavy, you should contact your supervisor as you are approaching the sign so someone can assist you with the installation. Communication is critical between flaggers. The flagger should also be able to communicate with the supervisor or pilot car driver throughout their shift in case help is needed to install additional graphic flagger symbol signs or possibly help a flagger to move to a safe and visible flagging location. The seventh and final situation deals with emergencies such as a broken utility line, a crash, fallen tree, or a washout. In these unplanned situations, the proper flagging equipment may not always be available. In that case, a 24 by 24 inch square red flag may be used for flagging traffic. When used at night, both sides of the flag shall be retro-reflectorized red-orange. Orange flags shall not be used for flagging operations. In emergencies, your first priority is to warn the public of the hazard. To stop traffic, stand on the shoulder of the road and extend the flag out to your side. Raise your other hand to the stop position. To release traffic, drop the flag to your side and with your free hand, motion the traffic to proceed. Never use the flag to motion traffic through. This confuses the drivers. To alert and slow traffic, extend the flag out to your side. Move the flag up and down from the ground to shoulder height. As soon as the proper equipment is available, the stop slow paddle should be used. Whenever a roadway intersects with the two-lane flagging operation, it must also be controlled by a flagger. A road work ahead and graphic flagger symbol sign is used prior to the flagger controlling the intersecting roadway. A flagging plan on releasing traffic at intersecting roadways should be developed at the beginning of the work shift. Communication between all flaggers is crucial when flagging at intersecting roadways. Now, let's summarize the seven flagging situations we've just discussed. Two flagger operation. This is the most common flagging procedure. A flagger works on each end of the work zone to control the movement of traffic through the work area. Good communication between flaggers is critical during this operation. Pilot car operation. This method is used when the work zone is particularly long or complicated. Good communication between flaggers and motorists is very important during this operation. Nighttime flagging operation. This can be a dangerous operation because of poor visibility. In nighttime flagging operations, high visibility performance class three ensemble shall be worn, which includes the outermost apparel as well as class E trousers. Overhead lights must be used to illuminate the flagger station. The lights must be adjusted to ensure motorists can clearly see the flagger and not be blinded by the glare of the light. The flagger station shall be illuminated and all traffic control devices must be retro-reflectorized. Street lights and vehicle headlights are not acceptable ways to illuminate the flagger stations and shall not be used. Single flagger operation. This operation is acceptable for a low traffic volume condition where there is good sight distance and the work area is short. One flagger restricting one direction of traffic. This operation is normally used where one lane of traffic is periodically blocked. When using the non-stationary flagging operation, one or both flaggers move with the work operation as it progresses. The road work next two miles sign warns motorists as they enter the work zone. Additional graphic flagger symbol signs are installed as the work progresses. A graphic flagger symbol sign shall stay within one half mile of the flagger at all times. Do not put yourself in an unsafe location. Be visible at all times and have a planned escape route. 
and never turn your back on approaching traffic. In an emergency situation, a flagger may use a 24 by 24 red flag until the stop slow paddle can be brought to the scene. And here are the flagger don'ts. No earplugs, no sitting, no talking on cell phones, no flagging from bridges or other places without a clear escape route. No flaggers are allowed to control traffic at an intersection controlled by an active or flashing traffic signal. Additional information regarding flagging at a signalized intersection can be found in the Virginia Work Area Protection Manual. Remember, no matter what flagging procedure is used, always stay alert. Face oncoming traffic. Stand alone in a good visible location away from other workers and work vehicles. And never stand on the path of approaching vehicles. If you are ever uncomfortable at the flagger station, immediately notify your supervisor and voice your concern. Open communication is key to a successful flagging operation. Your job as a flagger is one of the most important jobs in the work zone. Everyone, including the motorist, fellow workers, and you, will depend on your ability to properly follow these flagging procedures. If you ever have any questions about flagging operations, don't hesitate to ask your supervisor. The supervisor is an important part of a good flagging operation. As a supervisor, be sure that your flaggers understand their duties. Decide which situation requires flaggers. Select flaggers carefully. They must be alert and have good hearing and vision with the ability to move and maneuver quickly in order to avoid danger from errant vehicles. They should be courteous, able to communicate in English specific instructions clearly and firmly and have a sense of responsibility. Remember, the safety of the work crew and the traveling public is in the hands of a flagger. Advanced planning is critical for a successful flagging operation. If possible, a field visit should be conducted prior to the installation of a work zone. During the planning visit, the work area is defined, the location of the flagger stations are determined, and placement of the advanced warning signs are located. Sign spacing and buffer spaces may be adjusted based on field conditions to improve the motorist's visibility to signs and each flagger station. The location of additional flaggers and temporary traffic control devices, if needed, can also be identified. The Work Zone Safety Guidelines for Temporary Traffic Control Pocket Guide or the Virginia Work Area Protection Manual shall be used to properly lay out and install a successful flagging operation. Typically, the installation of temporary traffic control devices begins as a non-stationary operation. Signs are installed in the lane opposite of the work area first. The work operation vehicle protects workers while signs are installed. Once the road work ahead sign is installed, a flagger follows the work operations vehicle controlling traffic while the rest of the advance warning signs are placed. The flagger uses either a red flag or the stop slow paddle to control traffic. The flagger stops at the flagger station and controls traffic while the end road work sign is installed. Radio communication should be used during the installation process. Signs are then installed using the same procedure in the lane that will be closed for work operations. Once the flagger is in position at the flagger station, the work crew continues installing channelizing devices for the two-way tapers, buffer areas, and work area as necessary, and installs the end road work sign. The shadow vehicle is parked in the work area and work equipment is moved in to begin work operations. At a minimum, when installing temporary traffic control devices, the work vehicle with the signs should be parked on the shoulder when possible. Signs are removed from the rear of the work vehicle the worker walks along the shoulder side of the work vehicle to position the sign in advance of the vehicle which is serving as a protection vehicle. Select a good location for each flagger station. The flagger should have a clear line of sight to the back side of the graphic flagger symbol sign. Be sure your flaggers have the proper equipment and the flagger signs are in place before flagging begins. The supervisor and the flagger should always ensure that the flagger has an escape route. The flagger must be able to react quickly to avoid an errant vehicle at all times. 
A flagger should never position themselves on a bridge or box culvert. Areas with steep banks and rock outcroppings should be avoided. Never position yourself around a curve or over a hill. Fence lines and guardrails are other areas that should be avoided whenever possible. Items such as coolers and light plants must be positioned so that they do not interfere with the flagger's line of escape. If motorists consistently brake hard, then there is a problem with the location of the flagger station. The supervisor should speak with the flagger throughout the day to ensure that the flagger station is highly visible and traffic is responding appropriately. Assure the flagger it is okay to voice their concerns, especially if motorists are consistently braking hard to stop at the flagger station or if traffic is reacting erratically when backups appear. There is nothing more important than your safety and the safety of the crew. Flaggers should be relieved every two hours for a minimum period of 15 minutes. This helps to maintain their alertness while standing in the flagger station. Drive through the work zone and observe the flagger's operation. Unexpected actions by motorist or skidding may mean that the flagger station needs to be moved or adjusted. The graphic flagger symbol sign shall be removed anytime the flagging operation is suspended during the work shift. At the end of the work shift, all signs pertaining to the work zone must be removed. When removing temporary traffic control devices, start at the end of the channelizing devices and remove them in the reverse order as they were installed. Signs are removed with the flow of traffic. The work crew circles back to remove the signs opposite the work area while a flagger controls traffic while signs are removed from both directions. When railroad grade crossings exist either within or in the vicinity of a flagging operation, traffic shall not back up across the tracks. If traffic backups cannot be avoided at the railroad crossing, a uniformed law enforcement officer or a certified flagger shall stop traffic prior to the railroad crossing, even if automatic warning devices are in place. Simple enhancements can be made to the flagger station the flagger may use a stop-slow paddle equipped with flashing lights as described in the Virginia Work Area Protection Manual. Flares can be placed on the pavement near the flagger station. A supplemental flagger should be considered in advance of the mainline flaggers when field conditions prevent adequate sight distance to the flagger station or times when traffic cues appear. A graphic flagger symbol sign should be installed in advance of the supplemental flagger. The supplemental flagger stands on the shoulder of the road displaying the slow paddle to oncoming traffic. With your free arm outstretched, motion it in an up and down motion to slow traffic. Remember, never stand in the path of oncoming traffic. A slow sign may be added in the advance warning area when geometrics conditions prohibit the use of a supplemental flagger. The use of portable temporary rumble strips can increase both the motorist awareness to the approaching flagger station, as well as give an audible warning to the flagger that a vehicle is approaching. The rumble strips ahead sign is added to the sign layout, typically in between the one lane road ahead sign and the be prepared to stop sign. The automated flagger assistance device, or AFAD for short, is a device remotely controlled by one or more certified flaggers. The AFAD allows the flagger to be positioned off the roadway or within the safety of the work zone. One flagger may control two AFADs, but they must have a clear line of sight to the back of the graphic flagger symbol sign in both directions. Regardless of how many flaggers are used, they must be positioned to have a clear line of sight to approaching traffic. There are two types of AFADs used in Virginia. The first is the stop slow sign, AFAD, and the other, which you see here, is the red yellow lens AFAD. Each AFAD shall be equipped with a red and white retro reflective gate arm that is used to stop and release traffic. Also, four channelizing devices are placed on the center line prior to the AFAD to guide motorists to the AFAD. Please reference the Virginia Work Area Protection Manual to ensure the AFAD 
is the proper device to use for the work operation. Prior to using an AFAD, you must be trained on the proper procedures of the AFAD that will be deployed. A shadow vehicle is required in all flagging operations, including installing and removing traffic control devices. The shadow vehicle may have a truck-mounted attenuator, or TMA, on it to enhance the operation. For additional information on flagging operations, you may refer to the flagging section of the Work Zone Safety Guidelines for Temporary Traffic Control Pocket Guide produced by the Virginia Department of Transportation. You may want to obtain additional copies of this pocket guide for your flaggers. The Virginia Work Area Protection Manual provides additional information about flagging requirements in Virginia. This video is a general overview of proper flagging procedures. On-the-job training is the next step to improve your flagging skills. It is now your job to apply the correct flagging procedures you learned in this video to the field. It is your supervisor's job to ensure you do your job correctly. Flagging is one of the most important jobs in any work zone. It is also one of the most dangerous. However, with the proper equipment, training, and understanding of the procedures, flagging can be a safe and effective operation.